Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. This week we take a break from pandemics and property and instead turn our attention to the rising problem of finding sustainable and worthwhile income in the current low interest rate environment. As central banks worldwide have eased rates in response to the coronavirus and to help minimise financial interest pressure during and to support growth uh, during and to support growth on the other side of the pandemic, common low-risk income options available to retirees and pensioners have been reduced to fractions of their usual rates of return. This presents a tough job for both self-funded retirees and institutions who provide the pension products, as the need to reach for riskier assets rises or be faced with potentially running out of capital. Here to help us find income in a zero interest rate environment, I'm joined by Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Klassen. Hello, Damien. Hi, Tim. And uh, just a quick reminder, but before we get started, to subscribe on YouTube and to click on the notification bell to be notified of when we go live or have a new webinar to watch or follow us on your preferred podcast platform. And for those listening in live now, feel free to drop in your questions along the way in the chat box at nucleuswealth.com forward slash webinar. So let's get into it. So the agenda for today, we're going to start with a uh, rounded philosophical outlook uh, on uh, or approach to yield. We'll then be looking at a range of different bonds. So firstly, government bonds, and then turning our view to corporate bonds. We'll then be looking at stocks uh, and looking at uh, another form of, I guess, uh, dividend income uh, as opposed to uh, bond income. And then finally, rounding it out, as we always do uh, with an investment outlook and how we use these themes in the portfolios at Nucleus Wealth. So to get us started, we'll uh, jump into something slightly philosophical, philosophical, <laughs> Damien, our approach to yield. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because I guess the main thing I wanted to sort of drive through this, and it's I might be um, giving, giving it all up front, we might lose a few, uh, lose a few watches after, after this, is that um, we're, we need to acknowledge that things have changed <clears throat> and that we are in this low interest rate uh, world and that uh, what you've what worked in the past is going to work now. Mm. Um, it's a part of going, well, you know, I, I, uh, I live with a house full of teenagers and, um, and they, uh, they can eat pretty much whatever they want and don't add it, don't add a lot of weight and, and all that type of stuff. And I used to be able to do that, but, uh, as you get older, all of a sudden you, you can't, you can't do the same, uh, can't do the same things. And that's effectively, you know, a similar type of message now is that, um, uh, you know, being able to, being able to say that I've got a block of, Money and I'm just going to live off the uh, live off the interest and not eat into the capital um, is uh, is basically not not an option anymore. Um, you know, I think there's the the choice of actually saying you, you're going to get out there and um, refuse to accept you know these low dividends and, and get out and chase uh, higher dividend stocks and uh, riskier uh, scenarios to try and um, to try and replace that income. The danger that is there is you're just going to lose your capital. And so, if if you're running a risk of losing capital, I guess what I'm saying is you're better off saying, "Well, I'll I'll purposely take a small amount of my capital off every year with the view that um, to, to to get what you need to to survive, rather than chasing this higher dividend yield and ending up losing the capital anyway on the other side because um, because you're, it's, a, it's a much higher risk uh, where you'd have to where you'd have to stray to get those types of returns. Um, so that's the first point. The other point, the the, the key point though. Um, is that inflation is, and it's very hard to, um, it's very hard for people to, to, to get over this, the view that inflation is something that's there and it is eating into your, um, into your income every year. So if I'm sitting there with, um, you know, say a five hundred thousand um, uh, dollar retirement uh, nest egg, and you're sitting there sort of chipping away at that every year, if there's three or four percent inflation out there, and then you, then you're adding on another two or three percent. Um, to get this nice high yield, and and you and you feel as if you're sitting there not eating into your capital, so your 500 is not staying; it's just staying where it is, and and you're generating this seven percent yield and using that to to fund your lifestyle. Um, that might feel like you're um like you're not eating into your capital, but if inflation is, as I said at the start, sort of three or four percent, then you are actually eating into your capital from a, from a real perspective. Um, it's just you don't; it doesn't feel like you're doing that. 
And I guess where we are now is we're in this 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 world of uh, low inflation and low interest rates, and, and so the uh, that that same part. Um, I guess you're not from a, from a real perspective. You might you might up end up in the same position. Hmm. Um, in the you, you're still going backwards slightly every year in a, in a real sense, but it's um, what's going to hurt is that now it's actually in a nominal sense as well, and people like to see that their balance you know isn't changing. And I guess there's um, you know so 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 I guess you've got two two choices. One is you either up your risk and run the risk that you lose capital, and um, we'd suggest that for for most people who who income is an important factor. Um, you know, that's that shouldn't be your option because it, it, almost by definition, if you want this stability, then then you shouldn't be chasing those types of ones. Or the second part is then um, so there's a bunch of things we can do to try and um, ameliorate that and try and actually find some income that's going to help you. And, and we'll go into that in the rest of the um, the podcast. Mm. But but understanding that that the world has changed and, and accepting it and not trying to chase, not seeing you know um, who was the Mayfair one that came out recently, you know. Well, yeah, doing the was it six to eight percent or something? Uh, yeah, that's right. First mortgages and yeah, well, and look, I think that's you know, and that's a big thing. Obviously, you know, we've got term deposits now that's sort of in the what one to one and a half percent mark, and um, as you say, you know, the first thing people think about is, oh, well, I'm going backwards, you know, just against inflation, which is normally you know the one and a half to two and a half sort of range. Um, you know, so it's, I guess in a, in a way, it's a psychological change that needs to happen as much as a an investment change perhaps absolutely absolutely and um i think there's that the the, the part where you see these uh, things like the you know that like the mayfair where they are advertising you know six to eight percent um in in this environment you need to look very very suspiciously at any of that <laughs> sort of bit of a red flag <laughs> exactly there's and that's it's it's actually it's interesting in um we run it in, in our models on on stocks as well but but it's a, it's a very common phenomenon is that amongst all investment professionals in that um you know you see a yield of one percent and you go okay that's pretty low and then let's say we're looking at stocks and then you see a yield of like four or five percent you're like okay that's a pretty decent yield you can get out of that stock and, and whatever you get and then you, you see a yield of like eight or nine percent you're like uh oh what's wrong here <laughs> you're like that's that's not it's too high to be real there's, yep. there's a problem there and it's, it's you know there's a it's it's um and that's sort of getting back to this one of these i've got there the, the yield or value traps and um and, and what these ones are is these are the ones where uh you know it's in there at, uh it's got a the stocks at a, at a dollar and it's or let's say it's stocks at ten dollars um and it's paying a dollar um dividend so you're getting like this 10 percent yield it looks like it looks fantastic but um, yeah, six months later, the stock, the, the management suddenly says, oh, um, "We're not going to pay a, we're not going to pay a dollar in dividends anymore. We're only going to pay fifty cents." Mm. And so the share, the share price halves. Halves, yeah. So, and so you're still getting a ten percent yield on it. It's just that you know you started with a ten dollar investment, and then now you've lost fifty percent on the capital. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah well. <laughs> and it's still on this. And still, the yield still looks fantastic because people are looking at these things and saying the yields aren't sustainable. Hmm. So that's that one part. The other, the next part is the tax effectiveness as well. So um, it is worth, uh, you know, this is this philosophical approach as well in terms of looking at it saying, well, if you could have a choice of, of getting a, a 5% return um, as a capital gain or a 5% return as an income, um, depending upon your tax situation, for a lot of people, the capital gain is is actually more attractive from a um, from a tax perspective because and of the are, um, discount. Because it will the twelve month fifty yeah, percent discount. Yeah, you get the twelve months. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Um, and and also it gives you the chance to um, you can manage, especially if you if you've got a portfolio of shares, you can manage it a bit better. Yep. So um, so for example, we within our um, we run separately managed accounts for for our clients um, uh, where we we have we have the same portfolio, but every client gets sort of their own shares within it, and what we did just before um, uh, just before the end of financial year is we we're sitting on um, some some decent capital gains over the year, uh, and then we just had a we had to dig through the stocks and just went look where are the stocks where we're actually happy to own a different stock and, and we're sitting on a loss from it, and so it's a matter of then saying okay well let's let's take the loss on on, on that, mm -hmm. and that helps to offset the uh, the the quite significant gains we'd made sort of elsewhere in the portfolio. It means that um, the tax situ from a tax perspective. Um, it's much more efficient for for the, for the users. So, sure. so I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, don't get too hung up on the whole part about, um, you know, I have to get this yield from these stocks. If if you can get the same result 
in, in a more tax effective me measure by by getting in this capital gains and then selling some stock, um, you might find you're actually in a better position uh, after tax. Yep. Um, the other thing with the tax effectiveness as well is, um, you know, this is I guess a lesson from from my younger days when I when I first started investing is, you know, I found a um, there was this structure that um, uh, been it was a st structured product had been set up so that um, it, it delivered. Uh, distributions as capital returns, and it was very looked like it was going to be really tax effective in terms of the way it was. And then you, you got the capital gains and everything later on. So, um, yeah, from it, it seemed like it was going to be really, really tax effective, and it actually ended up being way more tax effective than I thought. Mainly because um, it was relatively, it was a lot higher risk than I'd realised, and <laughs> um, and so, so the uh, rather than having to worry about paying tax on on dividends i didn't have to worry about the dividends at all and uh i had a capital capital loss to, to uh. <laughs> make it even more tax effective for me so um <laughs> uh I, I guess that's the first thing you know is is you should always be um investing on the basis of the actual investment first hmm. so so dig through the investment what what am i doing what what return am i getting on this what, what return am i getting on this investment um and then once you're done now you can look at the tax structuring and how it's going to be most effective. Yep. Because um, there's a bunch of things out there that'll go. You know, you take a fair bit of risk and you might get, say, a three or four percent return on it, and and it might be you know very tax effective that three or four percent return, which, which might you know let's say it's fully franked or something and turns it into six or seven. Um, but if you st just take a step back and looked at it, you know, without uh, assuming the tax part. That's and said, right. Well, is it worth getting a three or four percent return for taking this much risk? Yep. And, and if the answer is no, then you shouldn't be you shouldn't be doing it just to try and chase the uh, the tax stuff. So I guess, um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, well, that's right. And I've seen it time and time again in in, in my time as well, where um, the, the the tax benefits is is what it leads on. Um, you know, and you, there's a range of all things out there. You know, from um, agroforestry to ostrich farms to do you name it, you know, and it's sort of, you know, you get a, a big tax, you get a big tax lead in deduction at the front um, and, and, and then people will invest, you know, and, and I think Australians are quite uh, quite driven uh, to, to, you know, to mitigate and minimise and get tax efficiencies where they can. Uh, probably say that to, to um, investment properties as well. Uh, and and yeah. so at the, end of the end of the day, as you say, though, you've got to make sure that the, the underpinnings of the investment are, <laughs> uh, you know, what you're actually investing in is, is the piece that, that you're concentrating on. And if you get the tax Absolutely. benefit, that's the bonus at the background. Yeah. As soon as you pick up a, um, a prospectus or a PDS or whatever to for, for some sort of capital and, and you notice that they spend more time talking about the tax effectiveness and what they do actually about the underlying investment. Yep. Um, yeah, that's uh, so you should be <laughs> red lights flashing and sirens and you know, that's right. backing out quietly. Mm. So, mm. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, so, so <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying philosophically um, – don't get hung up. Don't get hung up on the fact that I can't. There's no way I can eat into my capital because chances were, in, in prior years, you were actually eating into your capital anyway. Mm. You you just didn't notice it because it was coming from more from um, uh, interest rates, more, more from inflation. Sorry, than than it was from um, in actual normal terms. So that sort of leads on to the next. Um, the next part is is um, philosophically, you need to also be looking at. Um, so sustainability of dividends is very important. Uh, there's a lot of stocks out there where where you look at them and and they're, they're probably sustain the dividends are sustainable in the short term. Um, so some maybe some tobacco stocks are, are ones that might um, sort of fit that that criteria where you can see short term sustainability of di dividends, but over the longer term um, they're definitely not sustainable. And so uh, as, as you're looking through what you're uh, what you're looking to to buy or, or whatever it needs to be. You, you need to be keeping that that factor in mind, um, and then then the part is this growth of dividends. So, what we're trying to do as we're as we're putting together income portfolios for for investors is we're trying to find the right mix of the two. We're saying, okay, I can get a higher yield by by buying this stock now, and I can see where I can I can um, uh, I can see where the, the dividends are going to start to fade off over time. Um, but if I can if I can flip that out with some other stocks which have a lower yield right now, but but I, I can see where they're growing and, and the yield's going to increase in over time, then the net effect of, of buying a portfolio of those might be that I, I get quite a steady yield um, at at a higher level than than um, than what I would if I just bought all the growth ones, or if I just tr tried to chase the um, I, you know if you, if you go for just the 
the highest yield ones, quite often what you'll find is that that portfolio you yield will decrease over time because they're, they're priced, um, yeah, they're priced for, for the yields falling. So you, you get that higher higher upfront and, and lower um, going forward. So there's, so there's that part. <clears throat> and the other part is that um, what's important to, to notice that, that a lot of people don't um, don't focus the other the other real effect of having low interest rates is that capital becomes a lot more volatile so and the reason why um, I say that is if let's say we're talking about bonds um, if you're looking at a, uh, a bond that's got a, a six or seven percent yield and that bond moves by you know um, half a percent that doesn't make much difference at all to the, to the overall capital that's that's in there whereas when interest rates are half a percent and they go to zero or they go to one percent mm. that makes a big difference to the Huge capital percentage, so, but yeah difference yeah so so the capital is more, more volatile and the same is true for stocks um at, when they're on higher um pe's as, as we're seeing at the moment is that uh you know ex- price on a, on a very expensive basis what it means though is that um you do get a lot more volatility because uh when you're pricing something say on um, a good common measures is are, are what's called a price to earnings ratio. So how much the stock is worth versus how much it's earning. So typically um, that's sort of like 15 times or below. At the moment, it's more like 20 times. Mm. And so what that means is a, a small, um, you know, a small miss on the earnings front is now magnified by 20 times or 25 times versus you know 10 or 15 times. So it's sort of it can be you can see double the effect of the volatility on the um, on the share price. By, by changes in um, uh, yeah in either yields or, or in the uh, the earnings that these companies have, so <clears throat> I guess as you're putting together a, a yield portfolio in a low interest rate environment, you also need to factor in that you're going to need more diversification than what you might have needed in the past. Mm, okay. So yeah, in the past you could get away with a few instruments and and because they're, they're more stable, mm-hmm. whereas now it's actually no, I want to spread them out. You know, mix of sustainability and growth to try and make sure that over time I'm not going to lose out. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, yes, and the and the last one I wanted to highlight was uh, just some charts on uh, dividends and buybacks. <clears throat> so in Australia, it's worth noting that there's uh, you get this much higher yield in Australia because companies pay out more in dividends. And the reason why they pay out more in dividends is because uh, Australia is relatively unique in having franking credits, uh, which pass back to, to investors. Mm. And so if you look at the Australian payout ratios, you sort of see that Australian payouts are sort of 60, 70, you know, 80% versus the world, which is more like 30 or 40%. The only thing is, though, if that's because a lot of the rest of the world, um, the, the, the companies return their money through buybacks. And then you can see if you add that in on the on the chart on the right, you actually end up back where some some years Australia is lower, some years it's higher, but it's it's much more similar in terms of once you add in buybacks. And so, what a buyback effectively does is um, a company has a parcel of money they need to give back that they want to give back. So let's say they've got let's say the company's worth a um, uh, billion dollars and they're going to give back um, fifty million dollars, so five percent of the company. If they can either pay that out as a dividend. And what will happen is the share price will drop by 5%. But you, you'll get the cash in your hand. Share price drops by 5%. And so you know, the, the, the effect, what you had before and what you had after is, is, is the same. And then they'll build up to the next one. Whereas with a buyback, what happens is the cash still goes out to some shareholders and it reduces the number of shareholders. Um, but what, what typically happens is the share price will increase by 5% because you've actually got rid of 5% of your shareholders. Mm. So it's tight, tightening so, the, the register, so to speak. Yeah, and basically everyone gets a bit of a slice, bigger slice of the pie. Mm. Yeah. So the pie, the pie still um, yeah, stays a similar size, but everyone gets a bigger slice. Um, and so the issue is, from that perspective, is the, the net outcome is, is pretty similar. Um, you either got 5% as income or 5% as capital gain. Uh, obviously, the income is cash in your hand and it's, it's a, you know, feels a lot safer and all that type of stuff. But o- over a longer period of time, and, and, and whereas the share price can be volatile, but over a longer period of time, um, the two will, will, will even themselves out at, at similar multiples. So um, it's, it's that same point about saying, you know, if, if, you, if you're looking at companies that are, and the way we look at companies is um, companies that, that are returning company, returning capital to shareholders is a good thing. 
as opposed to companies that just keep having to suck in more capital to fund um you know the the, the growth ambitions mm. and so um so it's a good sign that the companies can actually afford they're actually generating enough cash flow to give some back to shareholders um and, and we don't get too hung up about whether it comes back as a dividend or whether it comes back as a buy, as a buyback uh i think what you'll find in australia is <clears throat> because of the franking credits uh when companies can't afford to pay a dividend what they'll actually do is they, they'll still pay the dividend but they'll then actually raise capital to um effectively the, the amount of capital that they need to pay the dividend right so so and and, and a dividend re- reinvestment plan that's that's effectively what all that is mm. is saying we can't afford to pay this dividend um so we're going to raise some capital to um in order to in order to pay it and so it's uh again it's just another one to keep in mind in terms of that whole structuring argument is yeah, it doesn't matter whether you, you 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 make a capital gain from from them doing a buyback and then you sell some of the shares, or does it five um, percent of shares, or does it matter whether you um, you get you get a dividend? And for different people with different tax scenarios, uh, you know, it's a, it's a different outcome. Mm. But um, largely, it's 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 a pretty similar outcome. And, and if you manage it right, it can be can be can be better if you're doing the selling down part from a tax perspective. Yeah, well, as you, as you mentioned, because you've got yeah, if you've got the ability to use those capital gains discounts and yes. that sort of thing then yeah puts you ahead of them and, yeah and if you're running a, a a reasonably sized portfolio that you can you can different stocks you can buy or sell yep and, and and actually the other thing as well is even if you've just been a long-term investor and you've been dripping money in over time um you can use the the ability that you go well you know here's a number here's here's a time when i happen to buy a stock at a high share price um and so I've, I, I can sell that passable with a, with a lower capital gain than than the ones i bought 20 years ago that I'm sitting on some massive capital gain for. Yeah, true. Uh, yep. Yeah. So there's lots of those, lots of little tips and tricks you can do in terms of those. So um, so that's sort of the overall philosophical side of it. It's saying um, you need to change your mindset and, and don't get hung up on my capital cannot go backwards. I absolutely have to make sure that I'm, I'm getting a high enough yield to, to fund everything. Mm. Um, you need to t- you know, switch that mentality. Um, and then the next part is that whole philosophical um yeah, sustainability and growth versus um, uh, and acknowledging much more diversification than what you had in the past because of the the volatility you're going to get uh, yep. in in capital prices. So sure. um, that sort of leads across into how, how you can do that with government bonds. So uh, the issue with government bonds and and uh, it's been described as picking up pennies in front of a steamroller um, in that there's this potential, there's this big potential downside to government bonds. Uh, and in that if interest rates rise quickly, then you can lose a lot of money on, on the, on that side of it. On, um, on, on present bonds. Yeah. On present on bonds. So bonds, yeah. I should, yeah, I should take a, let me take a step back actually. Let's, let me talk about a 10 year government bond. Mm. Cause I think it's probably better if I um, put it in perspective. So a 10 year government bond is, is actually, um, a very secure investment in, in a government. In, in, in if you're investing in your own local government, uh, especially if you've got one like Australia that can that's got its own printing press, or the US or or the UK where they can print their own money, is the chance of them defaulting is very very low because they can just print. Mm. It's, it'll basically be a political decision at that at some stage, and 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 almost always in the past when that happens, um, the first people to, like what what governments will usually do is they'll pay out local. Um, bondholders and they'll default on foreign bondholders because foreign, foreigners don't vote and locals do. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, it's only in really, really extreme circumstances that, 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 that they default on, on local um, borrowers. It's, it's much more likely that they just run the printing presses and, and inflate their way out of it. Okay, so, um, and so when I say they're, very, they're, the, they're one of the most secure out there is because I know when I, when I buy a bond on day one, what I'm going to get over that entire period. So if I'm holding this thing to maturity, there's no there's no surprises, there's no guesses. It is not like a I have to worry about what interest rates are doing or anything like that because I I know, for example, if I bought um, you know a ten year bond today, I might get say a three percent or four percent dividend yield on that, and I might have to pay I have to pay more for it because I might have to pay you know one hundred and ten dollars, and in ten years time I'll I'll sell it for a hundred dollars. And I'll get like a three or four percent yield over time, and the, that capital value will gradually go down from 110 back down to 100. Mm-hmm. And that's that's locked in. There's no, it's not what 
you know, what will I get at the end or will my dividend payment, if, if they raise interest rates or lower interest rates, will my will my yield change? It doesn't change. That's locked in from day one. So, yeah. it's, so it's basically as, um, as predictable as you can get in terms of an investment. So the issue is, though, if interest rates rise, then um, that will change. So, so because that three or four percent is locked in, if interest rates suddenly over, overnight rose to six percent, um, what would happen is that bond would fall from one hundred and ten dollars back to uh, about eighty dollars, mm. and and then you, the eighty dollars would gradually increase over time back to the hundred at the end. So, as an investor, if you'd bought it at one hundred and ten and you were holding it to maturity. Yes, it's fallen to eighty dollars, but if you're holding it to maturity, you, you, you know, X having to sell it for for emergency reasons, you actually don't care. You, you, your cash flows haven't changed. All that's happened is the um, you know, the opportunity set out there has changed. Mm-hmm. So, the the big issue is so <clears throat> with these is um, the speed of adjustment is is the key part. Is that so? You know, if you're investing in um, 10 year bonds and you know you don't usually people don't have like just one bond you, like most people have what they call a bond ladder and that's what effectively what we do for for our most of our core bond investments is mm-hmm. you have basically a bond expiring every year for the next whatever it is 12 or 15 years and so you might have 15 bonds you know one expiring every year and and every year one will expire and you basically just take that take the money from that one and stick it back on the end out in 15 years time and just they all shuffle down and so, if a if the bond yield, if the ten-year bond yield moved to say six percent over ten years, then um, you wouldn't actually lose money on your bond. You'd actually make a profit because what would be happening is because it's a gradual move. Every year you're taking one off and adding it back onto the end. It's yeah. not going to be a big profit. Like you, you're going to be it's, you're only going to make about half a percent per annum. Mm-hmm. But but it's not like you're losing. You know, it's not like your overnight move where you might lose thirty-five percent overnight mm. if, if interest rates move to six percent overnight. Um, and so, um, you know, and if, if, if it was faster, if interest rates moved to 6% over five years, you'd still make a loss. Um, but, uh, but it's going to be like about a two, two or 3% loss per annum. Like it's not a big change. Um, so it's not a good, it's not a good outcome, obviously, yep. but it's not like it's, it's not a dramatically, um, yeah, it's, it's not a dramatically poor outcome. And, and the issue with the, the, the and so some people just describe this because interest rates are so low as picking up pennies in front of steamrollers in that you're getting this these low returns from buying government bonds, um, but your risk is you get run over by the steamroller. Yep. And, and there's some truth to that, um, but the issue at the moment is the steamrollers, you know, you can hear it in reverse. So it's got the, <laughs> the sound's beeping. Yep. <laughs> so you're picking up pennies in front of it, yes, but it's going the other direction. Yeah, and so sure. When, when the beeping stops and and the and the it starts cutting back in the other direction, that's you 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 do need to, to make sure you're not trying to push this too far in terms yep. of bonds. Um, but but that real the real issue in terms of the um, the risks in bonds is inflation. Hmm. So um, you know getting that uh, and, and if if inflation comes back suddenly and um, you know all this money printing that that government's been doing when that finally gets traction, um, there'll be time to jump out of these. But at the moment, we're sort of looking at it going, um, you know, we, we don't have lots of bonds, but we've, we've certainly got a, a bit in there. Is um, with a view, We've got the view that Australia's got some of the highest returns on bonds in the, in the world. Mm. Um, and uh, most other countries are, are basically at zero or below. And so uh, if Australia goes more similar to other, other countries, there's sort of a 5 to 10% pro, uh, five to 10% upside. Um, and... If you got things really wrong, you know you might be losing two percent per annum. And yep. So with a five or ten percent upside, and you're getting a, a yield, and you've locked in some returns, it's sort of saying, well, that's as, as part of a diversified portfolio, it's worth having. Mm. But um, uh, you know that that interest rates, sorry, inflation is is the key thing to be watching. So and, and just um, on that, you mentioned before, so with um, global or or other you know international bonds. Uh, just some thoughts on on why they're not in the port in our portfolio, or why you wouldn't use those in in preference to the Aussie bonds, Damien. Yeah. So the issue when you buy, say, um, a US bond is, is US government bond is is you're taking um, two different risks. You're taking one risk is um, the solvency risk, uh, and and as I said before, if something goes wrong, um, and it's a low chance in the US, obviously, but if something goes wrong, um, can't countries will default on foreign investors first. So um, 
you can effectively pick up the same return on Aussie bonds as what you can in. Oh, sorry. So that's that's one that's one risk. The second one is the currency risk. Mm. Is so uh, you're not getting paid high returns at the moment, and you, and you're taking currency risk on the on the bonds, and so uh, you know you, you're really making more of a currency bet than than a um, than invest, an investment bet. The issue you need to consider then is you say, well, you, you can what's called swap that out, so you can you can lock your returns in so that you do get a um, you do get your returns locked in the Aussie dollars. Yep. But once you, once you do that, and, and after you've paid for it all, you actually end up with basically the return on the Australian bonds anyway. Right. Yep. So, so what what we're basically saying is, for the sake of the um, you know, for this for for, for for some traders, it's worth doing because there's small amounts of arbitrage you can get, but they're doing big trades with lots of uh, lots of leverage and and um, you know long short positions. Whereas for most investors, uh, you know, the hassle of actually buying a, an international bond then then um, swapping out the, the currency just to bring it back into to, to Aussie means you've effectively got the same yield as what you would have got by buying the Australian one and you're running greater risk. Not not a huge risk you know, for most countries, but you know, there still is a risk of um, a much higher risk of default. Than yeah, buying. sure. All right. Uh, look, thanks for that. We just had a, a quick question here as well, just on that inflation uh, piece. So um, from listener Ben, uh, besides runaway inflation, uh, what would lift interest rates, do you think? What are, what are some other risks to... Rising interest rates for the uh, the average federal bondholder. Uh, that's about it, really, at the moment. Uh, <laughs> there's, de- there's default risk, I suppose. Yep. Um, if uh, that's that's the major one. Uh, but at the moment, um, central banks are all focused very much on um, uh, central banks focused on trying to get inflation. That's why they're pumping so much money into the economy. Mm. Uh, and so, until we really see that start to take, and um, you yeah, know, keep in mind. The Japanese government, so Japanese central bank's been at it for twenty something years now, trying to do the same thing. Um, certainly, the US looks, looks to be doing more than what Japan did, but but it is worth noting that um, it's certainly not a given that um, that inflation's coming uh, and, in the short term. And it sort of leads into an inter- interesting one, I guess. So we, you know, we've got Japan who have had a, a very long history of, um, of, of you know of, of basically trying to win, you know to, to, to drive inflation and and you know, central banks. Uh, I think what is it now? About 120 percent or something of GDP or something's on the um, the balance sheet of the Bank of Japan. Is that right? Something in that vein. Yeah. Um, yeah. And basically, basically, what you do is you 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 um, there's there's more there's more of the debt is with the Bank of Japan than what's not with the Bank of Japan. Wow. Well, yep. <laughs> and then and then obviously the US has had you know well, let's call it nearly 10 years now post GFC of. Of stimulating to, to drive inflation, that doesn't seem to be doing much as well. We've got Australia now recently, you know, beginning open market operations in you know in the during the Corona, uh, you know, pandemic and turbulence um, in in March with uh, what they were doing to support uh, bond prices. Uh, you know, is there a, is there a view here that maybe you know it's just it's just not going to work? <laughs> like, is it you know is is inflation risk actually a risk given you know what's been happening with the central banks? So obviously, in in a um, Developed country over a you know an emerging country perhaps there's probably some easy examples on that side but yeah I think there's um, <clears throat> I mean the, there's a longer philosophical question we could have we could probably spend a whole podcast on that one and I suspect we probably have in in the past but um, there's this issue about um, uh, inequality is probably one of the biggest ones just in terms of people who are rich uh, save money and mm. people who are poor spend it and so. Um, <clears throat> And because we're increasing inequality at the moment, and most of these uh, most of these policies around printing more money and, and propping up asset markets just goes to further in- increase inequality, mm. um, and that that means you know that's more reason not to have inflation. Um, so, so, so inflation really there's there's two parts to it. Um, one's this uh, demand driven inflation, and the other one's supply driven inflation. So on the demand side. Um, there's the issue is how many people have lost jobs around the world and um sorry <coughs> and and are, and are now unemployed and so can't afford to to pay and also the uh the people who are um who are no longer out you know um they're in lockdowns or or, or they're limited in terms of just the, the whole psyche in terms of uh, confidence and, and needing to, to they, they might not have lost their own job but they might have seen a lot of friends lose it and so feel the need to build up some more savings so, um, so from the demand side, there doesn't look to be a lot of demand at the moment, um, in, in in most areas. 
And then it, it's it's sort of similar in the supply areas in that um, supply is similar in that a lot of companies have this a lot of excess slack. Mm. And so when companies have a lot of excess slack, they just want to get rid of it. And so they'll they'll sell it. You, know, you don't get inflation because um, you, you generally get inflation when there's too many too many too much money chasing too few goods, and so yep. those goods the price gets bit up. Yep. So X a few things like sort of toilet paper or, or gym equipment or, or things like that. <laughs> home, home equipment. Uh, um, you know, there's there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of sort of excess demand out out there. There's sort of there's not a lot of shortage of supply. Yep. So. Um, Maybe there will emerge shortage of supply if we come out quickly out of this. So that that's one potential for it, I mm. suppose. If um, uh, or, or if so many people are, you know, maybe maybe you'll get some some inflation from um, if lots of people aren't working that are in sort of all the service industries, but um, all those people still obviously need to eat and and and, and buy stuff. That's uh, and and that area doesn't expand. Yep. <coughs> so so yeah, possibly some. That but it's pretty pretty um, minor, really, in the grand scheme of things. In the current yeah, at, at the moment, I guess, I guess what it is is we've sort of shifted the burden of proof on inflation to saying, well, we, we want to see it first <laughs> um, before we before we believe it's there, um, because there's been so much of it. You know, there's a, a bunch of economists, um, you know, post the financial crisis, wrote to Ben Bernanke and, and, and high profile economists, um, you know, wrote this open letter to to Ben Bernanke saying. Um, you know his policies were ruinous, and there would be hyperinflation, and, and Weimar Germany was next, and mm. and it was Zimbabwe, and um, they were completely wrong. Yep. Like he he did exactly what he said he was going to do, um, and uh, and no inflation appeared. And so um, yeah, we've got we've got our, our reasons for believing why that is, but but I guess the, the big investment part for me is um, until we actually really see the start to take track, um, we, yeah, we don't bonds we, bonds are usable issue yeah yep, sure um <clears throat> the other thing then with these is you can um uh the 10-year bonds is is when you see people quote returns on 10-year bonds just keep in mind that, that that's actually a trading strategy not an investment and what i mean by that is that 10-year bonds is actually ba basically saying um i buy a bond i buy a 10-year bond and then in six months time i actually own a nine and a half year bond mm. So, so then I go and sell that bond, and then I go buy another. Well, you know, in, in three months' time, I buy. I've now got a nine point seven five year bond, and then I go buy a ten point two five year bond, and I hold that for six months, and and I just keep rolling that strategy. And so, <clears throat> there's actually trading returns within that as a, as a strategy as well. And given given bond yields are so low, and um, yeah, you know, it's it's not something we suggest investors should be doing. We, we're sort of more along the lines of most investors, most retail investors have got a bond ladder and that's enough. Um, the people who are doing those 10 year bond, as I said, are doing that with leverage and they're doing it with long shorts and, and trying to say, oh, we made, you know, uh, 0.1 of a percent here, but we leverage it up. So it turned into to, to point, you know, turned into 1% and, and we've done that every month and they, you know, we've got this 12% return or whatever by, by using it as some sort of trading strategy. Mm. So, um, so when you see what the returns are in 10 year bonds, um, keep in mind that's that's often quite different to what you get on a, on a real bond portfolio. Okay. And then, and then that final point I had there was just that that um, that's what traders are actually out there. You know, in terms of the real risks on bonds, is the traders doing those trades? Investors, you're actually getting more certainty because, as I spoke before, you know, you've locked in you've locked in your purchase price. You know what your exit price is, and you know exactly what how many dollars of dividends you're going to get or, or distribution you're going to get over the over the time period. Okay. Um, sure. I might flick on to the next one. Yeah, we'll jump across to corporate, corporate bonds. <coughs> oh, no, sorry. Oh, one sorry. more on, on just an inflation. So I've, already, I've probably already spoken enough about inflation. Um, it is worth noting, though, that um, uh, two things. One is there's things called inflation-linked bonds. And and with all these government bonds, these are, you can buy these on the ASX. They're all listed. Um, you can just uh, pick up the government bonds there under um, oh, GSC is they all start with or GSI and then they've got you know longer codes, um, but just bought normally through a broker. Um, some of these inflation linked bonds, what they do is you, you get a bond and um, it actually, the payments increase and the bond's value increases by inflation mm. every year. So um, let me put that a little bit better. So I buy a bond at, let's say I bought it on issue at $100 and it might, be, might only be paying a 1% yield on that $100, but what will happen is the $100, let's 
the amount I'm going to get back at the end will increase by inflation every year. Yep. So, so that hundred dollars, um, you know, if we've got two percent inflation for ten years, will end up being uh, one hundred and thirty dollars or something like that with, with compounding. And I'll be getting a one percent return on the hundred and thirty. So every year, my 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 yield will go up, hmm. and every year my capital return will go up with whatever inflation is. So so if you're really concerned about inflation, and but you want to get bonds within your portfolio, inflation linked bonds are are a great um, a great at the right price. Yep, it's just a question of how much inflation is priced into the bonds. And um, so this is this is not a trade where we're doing at the moment, but at the right time. Um, you're a big fan of inflation-linked bonds for, for really giving stability to people because uh, it solves that problem we spoke about in terms of you're worried about inflation might run up to 3 or 4%. Well, if you own um, inflation-linked bonds, then that's not a problem because mm. you, that just means your um, your bond value goes up by that 3 or 4% every just, year. Just a quick one on that. Uh, we've got a question that's popped in from Craig. Thanks, Craig. Um, what is the best inflation hedge? Uh, TIPS, which is the Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, um, or gold? Yeah. Uh, tips. So, tips. so uh, sorry. Tips. Tips are the U.S. version. Yeah. Um, in the Australian one says inflate. Yeah. Inflation linked bonds. Sure yep. Yeah. I'm sure if there's a there's a short term acronym for it, but inflation linked bonds in the Australian ones. ILB. So yeah. the, the issue the issue with gold is um, that it, it is a volatile investment as well. So uh, whereas these bonds are locked in, you you know what you're getting, and you know with an inflation linked bond, you know you're going to get inflation plus uh, you know some sort of small return on it. Yep. Um. And that's locked in. Whereas gold is, um, you might double your money, you might halve your money. You know, there's mm. a typically gold is a good um, uh, hedge for inflation, but there's been periods um, where it hasn't been a good hedge at all for inflation. Right. So um, uh, yeah, so you just need to be quite careful. Sort of in the 80s, when when um, all the central banks were, were selling down, um, you know, we had quite high inflation, but but in, but uh, the gold price uh, plummeted, mm. and so um, yeah, so so. Yeah, before that in the seventies, it was so for a period in the seventies, it was this fantastic hedge on inflation, and then for the eighties, it was a terrible hedge for inflation. So um, yeah, it's probably, I think it uh, gold at the right point is 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 good investment, um, but I think it gets too much credit for for being a um, a good inflation pure hedge. yeah currency hedge. Okay, yeah, sure, or inflation hedge. Um, and the, the last one, the duration. So the longer, if you buy a longer term bond, it is worth noting that you're going to be more impacted by price movements. So um, if you buy a, a one year bond, for example, or a two year bond, and interest rates went to six percent, doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect doesn't affect you much. And even if it did affect you, if you got a one year bond, well, I know I'm getting a hundred dollars in a year's time anyway, so I'm just going to wait wait for that time if I want it. Mm. If you want for it. Um, whereas uh, the um, if you buy the ten or or twenty year bonds, uh, that will really make a big difference. If you get a um, if you get a excuse me, the surge in inflation. Okay. Um, okay, so just, actually, just finally on that before we jump across to corporate bonds. So obviously, when we buy um, the is it GSBs on the, um, which are, you know uh, through the ASX and broken broken yep. up uh, essentially broken up larger um, sovereign bond uh, issue. Uh, what about buying at the initial $100? How, how, does, how does somebody do that? I had that question from somebody um, during the week, actually. Like, as opposed, so how, do you pay, how do you pay face value on, a, you know, on, a, on an issue? Because that seems like the domain of the institutionals that probably then resell it back down into the, into the secondary market. Yeah, but they don't always make a profit on it. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, if you're buying it on day one, you're going to get pretty close to $100. Sometimes mm -hmm. you might pick it up for $99, you know, sometimes mm. you might pay 101 uh, But, you know, especially on these longer term bonds, um, it's not a, in the scheme of the uh, the whole bond over the over the life of its its um, period, you know, you're talking quite small amounts okay. in terms of the difference. But, um, yeah, I don't think... I'm actually not. I'm not actually not 100 percent sure what they do when they put out new issues. Whether you can buy them on the ASX, you might be able to buy them in the initial part on the ASX. Right. I must admit. I must admit. I'm not sure. Okay. That's fine. Um, corporate bonds. Let's jump across. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uncertainty so has never been higher. <laughs> yeah. It's a fair so, point. <laughs> so this is the issue: is corporate bonds. Um, so coronavirus hits. Um, markets tank. Corporate bonds all lock up. None of these things, you know, not all of them, but any of the higher risk ones aren't trading. Um, and even the lower risk ones, uh, the yields sort of take this big jump to reflect that, um, hey, there's quite a 
quite a difficult time in for corporates coming up. Then central banks and government sort of step in and, and basically suspend a bunch of rules. So, so the US central bank in, in particular was out buying uh, higher grade corporate bonds. Um, we have uh, uh, lots of countries and Australia included have, have sort of suspended um, or, or made it bankruptcies a lot harder during this period in mm-hmm. terms of, um, you know, you, you can't, uh, smaller businesses, you can't sort of, uh, you can't make them bankrupt if they're for within the Corona period. Yep. Um, there's, uh, so, so you've got this issue about saying, well, how long are these rules going to last for? And at some stage, like we've already had the, uh, the UK came out, um, you know, uh, just last night, I think talking about their, their plan for, for pulling things out and stopping a lot of these payments and basically just saying, well, you know, there's never a good time to stop, but eventually if you can't keep, we governments can't keep putting money into businesses that, that no longer are going to operate. And so you can't just prop them up in the hope. Hmm. Um, say if it's a tourism operator and you're saying, well, it could be years before that comes back. Um, you can't have government sitting there just propping these things up forever. And so they're talking about saying, well, they're going to finish up in, in, um, uh, in October, I think. And then he, he was basically saying, well, there's people, if I finished in November, then there'd be people saying that I should finish in December. And if I finish in December, it should be January, you know, whatever period it is. But at some stage, governments will need to say, okay, uh, we're going back to normal rules. And that's the biggest danger for corporate bonds is that um, there are companies that, that are, that are, um, that are insolvent. So Hertz is a good example. Uh, we saw Virgin locally. Mm. Yep. Um, so the issue has been that you've got, so you've got this quite a high uncertainty about cash flows and can companies manage to get through the period. Uh, and on the flip side, uh, because of the central banks have been out buying corporate bond yields, they're actually quite ex- relatively expensive, particularly in, in, rel- in relation to the risk. So um, yes, yeah, so you don't pick up particularly high yields and you take a lot of risk on the, that, 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 the, that the corporate bonds might go broke. Yep. Uh, so I guess for me, I'm much more comfortable saying um, buy some buy some uh, you know buy some lower yield uh, government bonds or buy some buy some stocks where you've you've actually got upside. You're not getting much of a, you know your yields are very low and everything, and, you, and but you might actually get upside. But, but the problem in, in in corporate bonds is you, you're getting hardly any upside at all, and you've got lots of downside. So at least in stocks, um, you know I, I do think they're too expensive at the moment. They're in a bubble, but um, you can make an argument that the returns are possibly there if central banks keep throwing money in and and the stocks will actually go up more and and you know some of these will some, some of the stocks will, will actually do better out of the coronavirus and stuff like that so you can you make arguments for for buying stocks within corporate bonds but um you know it's, it's pretty hard for me to turn around and say well yes i'm going to get a you know for the next five years i'm going to get a four percent return by buying the corporate bond and there's a risk that this thing could, could go broke and i'll lose half my capital and saying, well, for four percent, you know, mm. it's just not just not worth the uh, not worth those that are low low yields. Yep. Um, and so that's yeah, that's this this whole part about this uncertainty. Um, uh, the fixed versus floating is worth noting as well. So you can you can um, some corporate bonds are fixed, like I said, the, the government bonds ones were, but but a lot of them are also floating. And typically in Australia, you'll see that's where the hybrids sort of sit. Um, and the issue with floating is. So, so when uh, you say, sorry, just to peel that back. So a fixed rate might be it pays five percent per annum um, on the on the initial amount, um, say a hundred dollars. Where floating might be linked to the cash rate plus a certain amount or something like that. Yes, exactly. Yep. So, so the benefit, I guess, of floating at the moment is you don't really have much interest rate risk because um, we think we've hit the bottom. Or we, you know, we're pretty close. Maybe we'll go to negative interest rates and they might go lower. But you know, that's. I guess there's, um, but, the, but the problem with that though, so that, that, that sounds sort of like a good thing in a way. Oh, there's only upside. So if interest rates rise, I'll, my interest rates, my, my, um, my interest will go up. But the issue is because they're not going to go any lower as well, and, and they're already very low, is you're just not getting high returns on these things. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so uh, a typ- typical hybrid might be um, two, two, two and a half, three percent on top of the, the, the rate which you know if it, at the time if it was two or three percent then you're looking at six which is a pretty good deal uh, now it's more like 0.25 yeah. plus plus two yeah <laughs> and all the and credit the hy- risk <laughs> and the hybrids are um, 
yeah, or even worse, because they're, they're sitting right at the bottom of the, the capital stack, so to speak. So, so if a company goes broke um, or, or goes into, let's take Virgin as an example, um, you know, shareholders are losing a lot. <coughs> uh, the next off the cap to lose is all, is is um, the the most junior debt. So there's like a there's various levels of debt in terms of seniority. Mm. So the senior debt senior debts are the last to lose their money, and the junior debts are the first to lose their money. And, and because the junior debt is the first to lose the money, they'll they'll get a higher. They usually, when things are, are good, they get a higher interest rate return. Yep. The problem is that's where hybrids sit. So when things go wrong, um, they're the first people to be wiped out. <clears throat> and then eventually, once you know, in terms of a, a bankruptcy, once the debt guys are worked uh, uh, are wiped out, then then the um, uh, the creditors start getting wiped out, and then finally, all the way up to the the employees, sort of the, the last ones to lose money. Yep. Oh, and the other thing is because the hybrids can convert into equity, can't they? Which is um, fantastic if equity is currently worth nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So that's, that's yeah, there's um, some of them have got quite fancy, um, uh, quite fancy uh, dilution and, and conversion things. And, and I always, you know, I think whenever you're looking at these instruments and, and they're not simple, they're, they're, they've, turned, they're, they've become something quite complicated, it's usually not because they've got your best interests at heart. It's usually mm. not because they're, they're going, you know, um, I really want to work out the best way I can, you know, I can make Tim benefit if, if everything goes wrong. Um, it's usually the, old, the other way around that they're going, well, if everything goes wrong, I want to make sure that I'm you know, protected. <laughs> I'm protected and, and Tim, takes, Tim takes the hit. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um. So yeah, so the big issues are this this whole government backing. Which companies which companies are which companies are government backed? Which ones aren't? I mean, that's sort of this whole you know part of this moral hazard issue and and saying well, is it right that that you're bailing out? Um, so in the US, you're know, bailing out some um, uh, cruise cruise ship operators and, and and airlines, or or should they be you know which or, or which one's going to be more like the Virgins where they're allowed to go bust, or, or Hertz where it's allowed to go bust? And so. Um, a lot of these are just trading on 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 speculation as to which ones are are going to um, be supported and which ones won't, and that's um, you know, there's money to be made there, but it's not really an investment. Um, mm. It's more of a more of a guess as to, to as to who's going to get the the benefit and who won't. Yep. <coughs> uh, the next one is um, how you buy corporate bonds. Yep. So uh, there's a few things I just want to make sure that it's important. To, to know when you're implementing is most people are going to be probably looking at exchange traded funds because uh, if you want to buy uh, corporate bonds, you usually have to deal in quite large sizes if you're going to be um, in the over over the counter market. You know, hundred thousand uh, dollar uh, tranches or, or some even half million dollar tranches mm. if you want to buy. So it's not sort of a matter of being able to say, oh yeah, let me you know I've got my three hundred thousand dollars, let me go and pick up you know half a dozen corporate bonds to put in my portfolio because they'll be sort of saying no no you can have you know you can have one yep <laughs> um <clears throat> so so most people try and invest through exchange traded funds and it's worth noting though there's a few big issues if you are going to uh, invest in exchange traded funds is first check what the actual underlying securities are so um for australian exchange traded funds in particular um you can end up with a lot of exposure to some european banks um which you might not have been expecting, right? Um, the other thing is a lot of some of the some of the exchange some of the corporate bond exchange traded funds basically have um, Aussie banks and, and Telstra, you know. So you, you think you're getting a diversified corporate bond portfolio, and really you've just got you know four different banks and and um, and Telstra. And so uh, you know knowing what you're actually buying in that underlying is is important within those ETFs. And the other thing is. Um, be prepared for the fact that um, these ETFs can have liquidity issues. So when um, you know when you've got a a liquid instrument, you know if we go back into sort of periods like we like we saw early on in the in the year where uh, the markets start to lock up, then some of these ETFs um, can't trade, or they or they have to trade at prices that are that are so low that the the market makers will make money on because the, because they're, they're not trading. They're, they're basically saying, okay, um, whatever it is, it's worth a hundred dollars. Um, but there's a bid for eighty dollars and, and an ask for for 120, and so um, there's this huge spread. And so if you're trying to get out, um, you know they're giving you the eighty dollars yeah, because right. the, the market makers then saying, well, I don't know what I can sell this thing for. Yeah, I think it's worth a hundred, but um, but I'm gonna have to sell it at eighty because it's all the liquidity is not there, and 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 they're not gonna make a loss, sort of helping you to get out. 
So, um, so liquidity issues. And then the other thing is fund lockups if you're in um, unlisted or or even some um, uh, some uh, yeah, if you're in um, some managed funds where what happened during the financial crisis was these things just went. Um, thanks for your money, Tim. Um, unfortunately, you know liquidity issues and all that type of stuff. Um, the fund's locked up, and and we're we're going to start selling down the assets, and we'll return the money over the next two years to you. Mm, so. Yep. So, um, yeah. So that which all comes back to that whole, <clears throat> you know, you want these corporate bonds for your yield, but um, if things start to go wrong, then um, corporate bonds are, uh, are are a tough place to be. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'll move on to stocks. So uh, the first thing on stocks I just wanted to highlight was this whole sector diversification part. So I've used these, um, this is a fidelity chart, which is just sort of showing the, the main sectors of the market um, versus each other. And so what you're looking for is you're looking for uh, diversification in this. So, so the ones that are highlighted is utilities and uh, information technology. And you can see it's got a, a low correlation of, of uh, 0.2, which basically means, um, you know, if, if one goes up, so if you, if you had a correlation of one, then one of them goes up, the other one goes up by the same amount on the at the same in the same week. Yep. Whereas um, at 0.2 means uh, they both might go up by the same amount over a, a three or four year period, but it's but um, one of them might go up for the first couple of years, and then the next one might go up for the next few years, and so you've got this diversification of um, all your eggs aren't sitting in one basket, um, and so uh, yeah. So the, so when you're putting your portfolios together, you want that whole mix of um, diversification so that you're not getting, um, say, for example, you know, you might think you're diversified by by buying four different Aussie banks, but um, uh, they're all they're all moving together in prices, mm. they all, and they generally do. Yep. So um, you want to spread your spread it out amongst sectors. The thing is, though. Um, the sector correlations are not what they used to be. So this is like a longer term look at, at sector correlations, but um, there's a whole bunch of other ways that we look at it as well. Um, so you can sort of keep some of this in mind, but uh, that that sort of last slide has a lot of that details where we're saying, okay, well, you you got to look at, <clears throat> for us, COVID and non-COVID stocks. So, you know, if you've got the ones, uh, the travel stocks and the... Um, uh, and, and the the energy stocks and, and um, banks that are, that are quite... Um, COVID uh, reliant, whereas there's other stocks that are, you know, some of your health cares and, and, and um, consumer staples that, that aren't really affected by, by COVID. So, so having that diversification is important. Yep. And those, those sectors aren't, aren't um, they're not the way that it typically would work. So say in, in, um, in a typical cycle, uh, you know, maybe you're, or a typical smaller cycle, your your REITs, your, your real estate investment trusts might actually be a source of stability for you, mm. um, but at the moment they're they, they're not. <laughs> and so, whereas a, and then you get into the um, uh, you get into say the utility space and a um, uh, something like a an electricity generator might be quite stable, but um, a, a gas pipeline might not be. And so there's there's these issues with um, yeah with the, the same correlations that happened before aren't aren't happening today. So so you want to look at correlations, but you want to also keep this one in mind. We will also look at um, a whole other, bunch of other other um, ways. So interest rate sensitive versus insensitive stocks. So so which are the stocks that really benefit as as interest rates fall uh, versus the ones that, that it doesn't really make much of a difference to. And so Damien, is that a, is that a sector thing or a, or a stock thing per se? Would be an example uh, of a sector it, or a stock that would be uh, so. So banks, um, yep. uh, utilities as well. Yep. Um, as utilities are, you know, interest rates go down, they they tend to go up. Yeah, right. um, and the insensitive ones are uh, maybe you take some of your tech stocks or yep. um, or yeah, things that are not not reliant. There's some more more of your growth stocks. Mm -hmm. um, you got these cyclical non cyclical issues in terms of uh there's some companies that do really well when the economy does well and really badly when the economy does badly so you could sort of ex they're, they're what you'd usually call a, t a cyclical stock yep and so something like a, a media company might be in that bucket where mm -hmm. um, when things are going well lots more people spend on advertising mm -hmm. and then um but when things start going badly people pull back their advertising pretty quickly yep okay um uh, growth and values another split I, won't, I probably won't go into that that's that's more of a technical one for um 
Uh, but, but we also look at business types, so manufacturers versus service companies versus uh, what we call landlords, which is not, not always just, you can get um, people that are basically sitting on intellectual property as well and not do really doing anything. And so uh, the way these businesses react is different. So and I guess what I mean by that is you might look at two companies in the energy sector and one of them might be a, um, uh, one of them might be a refiner, so uh, takes takes in crude oil, um, refines it into into various types of fuel, and and takes a margin. Yep. And there that might be quite stable over the period, whereas um, somebody who's a service company to oil oil rigs out there drilling new oil rigs um, can be very volatile and then, and um, you know very, we've got a very very different business model. So so the sector chart we showed before. Um, can hide some really big differences between how companies within the same sector will react when, when things happen. Yeah. And then, uh, and then finally the country side. So, yep. All right. Very good. Um, and I'll just quickly throw out to anyone listening in, uh, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash webinar for any final questions. I've got a couple here. So, um, just on that, and, and, and thanks for that, I think just rolling back into that sort of COVID, non-COVID piece, um, in your experience, obviously, now we've had, uh, what, three, four months, uh, you know, of, of, of being able to watch what's been happening. Has there been any surprise sectors or companies, I guess? Uh, obviously, you did a lot of work in, um, in in February, and there was a lot of work done in the portfolio to make it COVID resilient and try and find some, some upside and also avoid the losers. Uh, was there sort of any, I guess, you know, upside surprises um, in, in, in over the last sort of few months that, that where companies had sort of, I don't know, been net, net beneficiaries were you know, immediately obvious, perhaps? Uh, yeah, the um, probably the one that always jumps to mind on that front was uh, Smucker, JM Smucker, which is a uh, one of the biggest pet food companies right. in the US. Yep. Where we we had it, and we thought, oh yeah, that's pet food should should be relatively stable. I guess during the uh, during the downturn, and it actually, um, you know, a lot a lot more people have started buying um, uh, high end dog food, high end dog food, and or, and or pets, <laughs> or pets, them. yeah, yeah. Now they're at home, a lot, yeah. The, the number of pets sort of uh, increased quite dramatically, and so uh, yeah, you know, right. some areas like that. Um, I mean, I think there's certainly the, I mean, the online trading stuff um, was well, we're not we didn't have any in our portfolio, but that's one where. Um, you know, I guess it's an interesting question about saying, well, when sport stops, people get bored, and so then they they look for other ways to lose money and on gambling, and and so the day trading becomes attractive, I suppose. Yep. Um, so there's, there's, I mean, I think there's lots of those une, une, unexpected versions that, that popped out, which I think you know, post post it, you can sort of sit, sit back and go, well, yeah, I can see why I can see why that happened, but um, I guess there's there's certainly a number of things. We look at in terms of um, uh, the, the things we beat ourselves up for are the ones where we we go yes that there was there was a reason why we should have seen that coming and 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 jumped into that mm. whereas uh, as opposed to the ones going well I can understand why it happened but um, being able to predict it beforehand um, you sort of can't beat yourself up too much for for not picking the fact that sport would be cancelled and therefore people would then mm. open up. Uh, online trading accounts in in record of record numbers and oh look and it's a you know it's a, a, a enormously difficult task given the fact that there's no you know immediate um, comparison sort of period is it you know just sort of put it, put on the list for the next pandemic and uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's right <laughs> Can't well, fault. and and the issue at the moment is um, so I mean our it's our portfolio um, has still been outperforming you know at during the period, and we've sort of stuck with a lot of those names, but they just get they're getting expensive, mm. and, and we've been gradually tipping them out um, as they get expensive and trying to roll into ones that are that are still um, we're not ready to go to go back to the, uh, the 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 real losers from the pandemic, and you know, yep. say the the cruise liners and 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 airlines and stuff like that. Mm. So we're we're not ready for those yet. Sure. Um, but uh, finding stocks in the that that aren't overpriced and is 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 more and more difficult because I think obviously there's uh, there's a lot of people um, who've been talking about this whole rise in the stock market as being a bubble, and I think certainly in the professional markets um, it's very much looked upon that way. And so what it means is uh, there's some pretty crowded trades in, in people all trying to jump into that same sort of safety trades. So the ones we could jump on in in um, in January and February, um, you know, are now priced at 20, 30, 40 percent 
more relative to other stocks than what they were before. So, so we we spent a lot of time on relativity, I suppose, and we're, yep. as we're doing our, our our portfolio, just saying, well, when everything's expensive and we've got a certain amount of stocks we're going to hold in our portfolio, then we just need to find the ones that are the, the least expensive for the quality that, you, that you're getting. Mm, okay. All right. Fantastic. Very good. Uh, any final notes? We're sort of running just on time now, so um, happy to, to wind it up there if you like, Damien. Yep. Sounds good. All right. I'm, I'm gonna... <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, yeah, thanks to everybody who uh, popped in some questions there. Uh, and also, of course, you can uh, drop in uh, any further notes or questions in the uh, in the YouTube chat channel as well. Thanks very much to you, Damien, for a, a great show. And I think it's uh, helped to answer certainly a lot of questions that I've had from uh, potential and, and even current clients uh, over the last few months uh, in, in trying to really get your head around exactly where uh, some you know some income sources can be and, and what the pressure is there. So thanks, thanks for that. Thanks to everyone else for tuning in. Uh, and we hope you enjoyed today's show. So if you'd like to see more of our content, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash content to stay up to date with news from us follow us on all our social media channels or your favorite ones for that matter we always appreciate guest or topic suggestions so if you've got one please drop them in the comments of today's youtube video and we'll uh, approach that person or, or people and uh, and see if we can get them on the show and finally uh, if you know anyone who'd get something out of today's episode feel free to let them know about it uh, share it with a friend and help our show grow so on that note thanks very much for tuning in and we look forward to catching you at the next one cheers